Well, hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, 2023 Application Threat Report. My name is Caroline Belligan, Growth Marketing Manager here at Digital.ai, and I will be today's moderator. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. This session is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording in the next few days. Also, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box at the bottom of your screen, and we will make sure to get to those questions. Now, I'd like to introduce today's presenters, both from digital.ai. First up, we have Tadas Miseka, Director of Engineering. Welcome, Tadas. Hello. Also with us is Dan Shugru, Senior Product Marketing Manager. Welcome, Dan. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Perfect. Now, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you both, Tadas and Dan, if you would like to take it away. Sure. Thanks very much, Caroline. And thanks, everybody, for joining. And I'm hoping that you can hear and see us OK. Uh, so as uh, Caroline mentioned, I'm Dan Chagru. I work in product marketing for the application security uh, business unit and application security products. And we're very, very happy to share with you today the findings from our 2023 application threat report. So we'll uh, we'll go over um, this, the state of mobile security in general. We'll, we'll dive into threat data, um, both on an industry basis and then across the various platforms. Um, we'll talk about a couple of other hypotheses that we tested with the threat report. And then finally, we'll end up with um, a couple of recommendations around what to do about these threats and then open it up for questions. And very much looking forward to... Um, finding out what your questions are. And actually also throughout the presentation, we'll give a few polls so that we can find out a little bit more about uh, who you are, um, in addition to sharing with you, with you the data that we have. So um, digital.ai, uh, for those of you who don't know, is the inheritor of the ArcSan IP and uh, protection technology. ArcSan was founded way back in 2001 and was bought by um, a private equity company that combined ArcSan with some other DevSecOps companies, such as Zebia Labs, which is now our um, DevOps product, um, CollabNet version one, which is our agility product, Numerify, which provides a layer of um, artificial intelligence on top of our products, and Experitest, which does continuous testing. So together we are today digital.ai, um, and we are servicing more than half of the, the biggest for, um, companies in the world and the, and the, and the US more than a thousand customers worldwide, um, representing about a billion dollars in investment from TPG. Uh, Tadas and I work alongside roughly 598 other um, colleagues. And together, the companies that form digital.ai have over 50 years of experience and, and 75 global partners. Um, so, uh, you know, a wealth of experience and, um, and we're, among other things, trying to bring that experience to bear on the data that we find out about application threats. Um, <clears throat> just diving a little bit on the application security side, a little bit more deeply onto the application security side of digital.ai, we offer a full suite of app hardening solutions, mobile web desktop um, security, as well as white box, white box cryptography, which we call our key and data protection product. And then of course, threat monitoring, which is what we're gonna focus on today. Um, the research is headed up is a world class security research team that's headed up by Tadas, who we're lucky enough to have with us. And what we do is standards driven um, <clears throat> FIPS 140-2 uh, with um, pending and under test certification for 140-3. Uh, we work with OWASP and we're, we're an OWASP sponsor. Um, and across the world, there are billions of applications, instances that are protected by digital.ai. Um, so that's a, a little bit about what we do, and I, I wanted to call on the folks who are in the um, who are listening to maybe tell us a little bit about what they do, so we can potentially shape the content based on what we find out. Um, so the first poll that'll be come up on your screen is just asking, in which organization do you work? And this is radial, so you know, pick the one that's closest. Um, uh, Multi-select is not uh, is not uh, allowed. So we'll give this maybe, give people maybe 15 seconds or so um, to select. And then um, at the end of, we'll call it 10, 9, 8. We'll go ahead and look at the results. Um, maybe end it now. And I'll, I'll just 
take a quick look at the results and give some highlights so we could know who is here in the virtual room with us. So we can go ahead and close it. Okay, great. So we have, um, so, so this is actually encouraging. The, the people in the application security side have just barely edged out the people in the information security side. So 38% uh, to 33%. And then people who I um, identify their organization as DevOps, about 8%. And then um, in third is the people who are, who are product owners or managers. Um, so coming from, call it uh, product or sales and marketing. So, so this actually comports with what we have, what I've been finding over the two years plus I've been with digital.ai. Uh, when I first joined, the, the people with whom I spoke um, on the customer side or prospect side who were from InfoSec were the majority, um, probably I would say maybe just over 50%. And at that time and, and you know still today, many of the analysts in the space, Forrester and Gartner and others are um, collectively saying, that we should expect more and more security to, to take place and to happen um, on the product development side. Um, so we're seeing more people with titles like application security engineer um, and people who are reporting into the R&D organization or the product development organization, as opposed to the information security organization, um, <clears throat> which is encouraging for us because you know we were of the mind that we, well, you know, information security absolutely positively does continue to need investment. We do think we um, that the uh, focus can and should probably shift towards building security into products um, to ensure that, for instance, applications, as we're talking about today, are more secure. So this is very, very encouraging to see. OK, the, the second quick poll, and I promise not to talk too much about the results, is um, just you know um, we're wondering what tools and techniques does your AppSec program already include today. Um, so we're wondering, you know, are you using the uh, mobile application security verification standard from OWASP? Do you use static application security testing, um, dynamic application security testing? Are you using application shielding, which in this case, you know, we're defining as code obfuscation and anti-tamper? Do you monitor the apps that you put out into production or into the wild? And um, are you using runtime application self-protection or RASP? So this one is multi-select, so please select all the ones that you're currently um, employing or using. And we'll give this, uh, let's say, 10 more seconds and then quickly read out the results. Maybe five seconds. And then we can maybe close it and uh, I'll push, I'll, I'll, well, I, rather than push, I'll, I'll uh, speak to the results. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> more than a quarter of you are using some form of application monitoring. I'd actually be curious, maybe in a maybe in a follow up poll, to find out um, whether or not one hundred percent of that is is threat monitoring. Because I, I know there's obviously another um, th there's another market in monitoring performance of applications, but I'm, I'm suspecting this is mostly threat monitoring in this case. Uh, then we have uh, in second place people using static application security testing, which is not a surprise. Most of the prospects and customers we talk to are doing something with SAST. Um, and then just after that in third, DAST, Dynamic, which I also find personal experience have, is usually used less often than SAST. 15% um, of you using OWASP and uh, only 10% using um, RASP. So a, a pretty even smattering. Um, I guess we probably all like to see all of those forms of security used more often. Um, it's probably hard to use any of those too much, um, but but good to know that you know there seems to be a good representative um, smattering of people who are using the various technologies that are shown here. Okay, so um, high level view, you know, where are we in terms of the digital transformation movement that started? call it, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, um, we're well, 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 well on our way. So 4.8 million different apps are available um, as of last year in the Google Play and Apple Store. Um, those 4.8 million were downloaded 140 billion times in 2022. Um, and 86% of Americans, just as sort of one somewhat random stat to, to give out there, 
86% of Americans are preferring to bank either online or with their mobile app. And I'm guessing most of the people on this call are in that 86%. And it's, it's really a small 14%. And I would guess, or I would make an estimate, a small 14% that's shrink that's uh, shrinking very quickly. Um, very, very few people that I know are still actually going into a branch to a uh, bank. And I think, you know, that carries across not just FinServe, but but across uh, most industries. I mean, most of us are, many of us are using a Bluetooth app, for example, to open our cars. Um, we might be using a uh, an iPhone or an Android app to monitor some aspect of our health, glucose, um, or maybe um, a, a pacemaker, um, neurostimulation, et cetera. We're using apps for all different types of things, and and I think we're probably all well aware of that. And as a result, we're very interested in what the um, threats are to those apps. So to that end, we've got um, an expert here in Tadas Masika. And so I wanted to start with, you know, what's the, the headline finding, you know, overall, what did we find out about how often apps are under attack? And, uh, and was that more or less than what we expected? Yeah, thanks, Dan. So for this report, we looked at four weeks of data of AppAware data, which is our threat monitoring service that our customers use to, to see how their apps are being interacted with in the wild, what kind of malicious activities are applied on them. And the result is that 57% of those apps in that time period were detecting malicious activity, which was higher than expected for, for some of us uh, because of a relatively short time frame. Uh, so when an attack is being uh, when an app is being attacked depends on, on its life cycle. For example, games usually have a window of time when they are relevant, and after that, the interest in, interest in them starts to diminish. While FinServe, on the other hand, are, FinServe apps are usually getting regular updates, regular uh, use by consumers for years. Excellent. So. Not everybody was surprised, but I, I, if I remember correctly, the, the hypothesis was something around 50, 50 percent, so a, a bit higher than we thought. And um, what are some of the, uh, can, can we make some conjecture or estimations around what the reasons why, uh, you know, a relatively high number of apps are, are under attack? Yeah, so we, don't do, we do not have objective data on this. So these are all our hypotheses, so take it with a grain of salt. But we think, first of all, it's the pace of democratization among the threat actors and, and among the tools they use is accelerating. Decompilers such as Ghidra and dynamic instrumentation frameworks like Frida have recently become more, more powerful, more popular, and more accessible, uh, which means more people are, are using them and more people can try attacks. Another reason is monetization. So nowadays apps are full of in-app purchases and some even adopt cryptocurrency-like payments, which makes it easier for threat actors to cash out their hack schemes. And lastly, uh, we think nationalization of attacks has opened up enormous resources for threat actors. You may think that this is not really relevant when it comes to protecting client apps, as nation-funded attacks are usually aimed at some large infrastructure like a power grid. But we believe that even attacks like this they often start by analysis performed on a client application to understand the underlying system and, and its communication protocols. And uh, another side note on, on that high level stat. So keep in mind, this is just a four week period that we measured. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not look at a longer time frame for this year's report, but as we extend it, we quickly see that the percentage of apps being attacked is approaching 100%. So really almost all of the apps are being prodded at at some point in time. Okay, so that that last point being, if, if we um, widen the time frame enough, uh, eventually, for all intents and purposes, every app is going to be attacked in some way. Almost every app, yeah, we we'll believe so. Yeah. Okay, um, interesting. Um, and and if I go back to the the very first point you were making about uh, was it Frida and Ghidra, the the idea is that uh, the the tools that are um, that threat actors and, and or even just curious users avail themselves of are more readily available. Is that, yeah. Correct, yeah. There's a bunch of powerful open source tools that are quite easy to, to get running. And well, a few decades ago, you had to build your own infrastructure just to, to try to an, an attempt on an app. Hmm. 
And a few decades ago, there weren't even that many apps. I mean, I mean, there, there were things, yeah, there were things to hack, but they weren't being pushed out with the um, uh, with the speed and with the efficiency that we're putting apps out into the wild today. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Okay, so if we were to go a, a level deeper, if we were to look at <clears throat> comparing a couple of um, uh, industries, which were the industries that were attacked most often in, in this uh, time frame? So when we looked at, at, at industries per uh, attacks per industry, we found that the clear quote unquote winners were FinServe and gaming, yeah. with FinServe being at 62% and gaming at 63%, while the rest of the business verticals combined average about 54% of attack probability. Mm. Okay, and so the so first of all, this is the game that nobody wants to win, right? The, the winners, yeah. <laughs> two, two industries that I'm sure are not very happy that they're at the top. Um, but but then also the the gaming result is a bit surprising. I mean, I I think I probably would have guessed that banks were attacked more often because that's where the money is. Um, and any ideas why gaming uh, attacks are as likely as they are? Yes, you, you are correct. So. There's obvious benefits in attacking FinServe, like attack, attackers are eyeing direct financial gains from either misdirected transactions or stealing sensitive personal information they can steal and uh, use for fraud or sell in black market. But this is actually becoming more and more similar uh, in gaming. Gaming hacks can also result in, in similar monetary gains. Uh, hackers profit by gaining account access to steal in-game items and which can be worth a lot of money nowadays. If you ever looked at something like Counter-Strike and its cosmetic items, you know what I mean. And mm -hmm. selling cheats uh, hackers develop is also a way for them to make money. There's people willing to pay to get an unfair advantage in games. And another motivator to hack games, uh, not to be diminished, is, is the reputational gain for the crackers. Being the first one to crack a uh, of new as AAA title is a very lucrative achievement to many. There's large gaming piracy communities where crackers are basically praised as some sort of heroes. Okay. Yeah. So, so lots of credibility to be gained if, if, if for, for someone who is the first to crack, uh, especially a popular game. Um, and that, yeah, and your, your note about virtual currencies definitely strikes home with me because I, I know, you know, when I give my younger son uh, permission or, or, or buy a game for him, the spending doesn't stop there. there. There's often things that he needs or wants within the game to buy in order to excel. Um, and and if I don't relent, I mean, he ends up just not playing because it's just not that fun if he doesn't have the right, you know, shield or or, or gun or sword. Um, at least that's my understanding of it. Um, yeah, that's the unfortunate nature of these games. Yeah. Um, Okay, so that's that's uh, FinServe and gaming, and and some of this was in our report. And I think since then, you were saying that you've been able to gather more data about the nature of the attacks on each of these two industries. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So well, well, we found these high-level stats interesting on their own. We thought we could draw even more insight on the subject by analyzing what types of attacks we see in these business verticals. And what we found is that well, the probability of an F suffering at least one attack uh, at some time uh, is about equal in FinServe and gaming, which is what we measured in, in that previous stat. Mm -hmm. The frequency and severity of attacks is often significantly greater in FinServe, as you might expect. So we found in particular that there's more code integrity breaches in FinServe, more debugging and other kinds of instrumentation attempts, and more unsafe environment detections as well. And this okay. Uh, this is consistent with the common attack flow that we observe and, and hypothesize where an attacker first needs to set up a permissive and safe environment to run the app, uh, like a rooted phone or an emulator. Then they can use a dynamic instrumentation tool to analyze the app and find its weak points. And only then they're able to inject meaning, meaningful bits of code to achieve their ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. And sorry to interrupt, but you were, I think you used the word safe environment, but you meant from the perspective of the threat actor in that case. Yeah. They, yeah. It's, it, yeah. I'm on the unsafe yeah. environment. And, and then, and then the other thing that I wasn't sure if I picked up was, uh, it was code integrity was the first protection or, or violation that you mentioned. That, yeah. It's, it's yeah. one of the more severe types of attacks. Okay. And, and then, uh, so, 
so then uh, even though overall the number of attacks on FinServe um, and gaming were roughly similar, there were more of the uh, more severe attacks on banking. Yeah. And it, what's is the flip side of that true for gaming? I, assuming it is in order to get the numbers to. Yeah. So, so what I mentioned is all true for FinServe. In gaming, all these attacks exist as well. They're just a bit less common. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, in gaming, there's usually a, a quite clear time frame, a limited time frame where that game is relevant or interesting. Uh, for example, if a game is already cracked, there's very little incentive for others to, to come after and try to crack it as sure. well again. Yep. Uh, but in gaming, we saw more virtualization and emulation uh, compared to FinServe which are not necessarily attacks. Uh, they're just unsafe types of unsafe environments. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are usually seen by consumers as convenience or uh, a, a way for better accessibility. But they're also confirmed risk indicators as demonstrated by our recent research on Android app virtualization, where we found that apps being run in these environments are just as vulnerable, if not more than in rooted phone environments. OK, cool. So. Um, in order to, the, the reason that the end numbers are roughly similar is because <clears throat> even though there are more um, serious, there are a greater number of serious attacks on the FinServe side, there are a greater number of sort of uh, less serious attacks on the gaming side. And then if we put those together, we basically get the same number of attacks, even though the right. potential, yeah, the potential damage on the FinServe side sounds like it's um, greater. Yes. Okay, cool. It's hard to say that uh, clearly without tripping, but I think I think I think I get it. Um, okay, so that's uh, FinServe and gaming. How about the um, the Android versus iOS um, comparison? I know, at least in the popular media here on, on stateside, you know, Apple spends a lot of time convincing people that they are more private and more secure than Android. Uh, does the data bear that out in our case? To an extent, yeah, that's true. So we. This is what we expected as well when doing this research. Uh, Android apps are about uh, one and a half times more likely to be run in unsafe environments. And if you look deeper into more severe attacks like code modifications, the gap becomes even bigger with about four to five times more likely uh, on, on the Android side. An example of a code modification at attack could be injecting some code that side channel sensitive information to a command and control server where a hacker can access that private information. That, that's an example of the uh, an attack that would be counted at the bottom there? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> OK, and then the um, uh, what, what are some examples of unsafe environments uh, for Android and, and iOS that, that might not lead to something, you know, a serious breach? Most common ones are root environment in Android and a jailbroken phone in iOS. Mm -hmm. But it can also be something like uh, emulation, virtualization I mentioned before, and, and many others. OK. And a, 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 let's say, rooting or jailbreaking a phone, that could be done by a threat actor. And it could also just be done by someone who um, is a curious user and wants to, let's say, side channel an app into their phone that, that isn't otherwise available? Correct. In, in iOS, uh, a common use case is to, to use pirated apps from a gray market app store. And in Android, it can be as silly as just wanting to mod your uh, uh, visuals of, of, your, of your operating system, of the UI. OK. But the, the thing is that few people realize how, how much this exposes them to all kinds of malware and risks. Right. Yeah, and I guess it should be clear for the listeners, I, although I, I'm guessing, you know, most of our listeners are security professionals. You know, we're not advocating doing this. We're just pointing out that there's a difference in severity of, of you know, rooting a phone versus um, modifying the, the app, um, modifying the code in, in an app on the phone. And obviously, you know, when we're talking to end users, <clears throat> which we sometimes do, we would recommend against violating the terms of service of a phone and certainly recommend against using a third party app store which may or may not have, you know, be hosting malware, or at least I, I think it's safe to say has a greater chance of hosting malware than uh, the Apple Store or the, or, or the Google Play Store. Um, okay, so that's Android um, versus I, iOS. 
the other the other bit that I was interested in was I know we had a hypothesis that uh, the apps that uh, we protect that are more popular would almost surely be attacked more often. In other words, you know, we were testing to see whether there was a correlation between popularity and propensity to be attacked. And what did we end up finding there? We could jump into that or we can talk about why we think oh, okay. there's, yeah. there's this difference yeah. if you want. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, as, as you mentioned, Apple spends uh, a lot of time and, and uh, effort on making it more secure. And it being a, a restricted proprietary ecosystem just makes it less vulnerable. It's more difficult to, to craft an attack. Mm -hmm. There's more controls in iOS regarding root access. Jailbreaks are often more sophisticated than Android rootkits, and it's more involved to just get them working. And there's uh, very strict restrictions regarding what version of iOS, what processor chipset uh, needs to be on your phone for a jailbreak to work. Mm -hmm. And this makes running on site code significantly harder in iOS, hence with big gap in the bottom stat. And Android being open source is just much more accessible. People can install custom ROMs, uh, even make their own builds with kernel modifications if they're advanced users. And communities for Android attack tools are usually much larger. Uh, so a tool like Alice Post gets more, uh, more development compared to some of the iOS targeting tools. Uh, so yeah, tools in Android are, are easier to use, easier to start using. All that said, uh, the takeaway should not be you just you can just protect your Android app and leave your iOS app security to Apple. While attacks are less frequent there, they are still just as severe and an advanced hacker can work around these restrictions I mentioned. And mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it, all it takes is just one big breach to cause tremendous business damage, as we've seen in some of the examples during the surge of MageCart attacks a few years ago. Yeah. MageCart being that attack on British Air, uh, so maybe three or four years ago. That is one of the, one of the more one popular of the examples, yeah. but there's a lot of these. Hmm. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. And thanks for staying on this topic. If I, so if I, if I uh, understood correctly, uh, you were saying, well, a few things there. Um, one is that the, you know, Apple does, well, Apple has, has released a closed operating system. So it's proprietary as such. There, there are uh, fewer opportunities for threat actors to um, build um, malware or, or to, to uh, uh, threaten the apps that are on the platform itself. And then I, I think the other one was you were saying the, the community of um, we'll call them curious users and threat actors within Android is, is actually bigger than iOS. And so there's, it's almost like a network effect where it sort of reinforces itself because there's more people doing it, more people want to try it, um, and there's more people to help those who want to try, um, and that ends up ending in more attacks. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And then the last thing, which I, I think is very important, and, and maybe just, you know, for the listeners, uh, you know, uh, most, if not all of our customers um, will protect both Android and, and iOS apps. I mean, there's very few companies who are only releasing an app for one of the two platforms, you know, where in, um, in Europe, Middle East and Africa, typically there will be more emphasis on Android because it's simply more popular there, but iPhone is still a big enough market share that it absolutely has to be protected. And then sort of the flip is true in uh, North America <clears throat> where the emphasis will usually start with iOS, but will always carry over to Android because there's you know enough Android users that it matters. Um, so yeah, that I think luckily, and the good news is you know for the security community is that people are focusing on both, even though they may uh, start with focusing on one of the two. Um, okay, so shall we move to the other question around uh, popularity and risk? Great. So yes. yeah. So, so what was the finding here uh, in the end when we looked at um, popularity of an app relative to the propensity for attack? So personally, this one surprised me the most out of the hypotheses we had. I expected, as you might think, that the larger the user base, the more opportunity there is to monetize a hack. But in our data, we saw no clear correlation between these two factors. So based on these findings now, I think that the likelihood of an app being attacked depends much more on the opportunity for monetization within the app itself 
mm -hmm. example, does it collect any personal data that can be stolen? Are there any obvious ways to, to cash out money, etc.? Uh, so there are apps that have a lot of users, but no obvious merit to cracking them. For example, could be a game with a, without a leaderboard, so no incentive to cheat, or no monetization within the game. Uh, there's a few of these nowadays, I guess. Yeah. But there are also apps that have very rather small user bases, but a very high chance of being attacked. Like uh, an interesting example uh, is uh, medical device software, where users often attempt to modify them against the recommendations of manufacturers just to, to achieve some, some goals. And in some cases, obviously, this is very dangerous and vendors want to prevent it. Right. In, in a case like that, it's uh, very much a case of buyer beware or user beware. Um, the end user, who is essentially the patient, might think that they know better than the doctor um, and, and want to tamper with the app, change it to do something that they think uh, would be better for them. But obviously, that potentially puts them, their own lives in danger. Um, and then, of course, um, the company itself liable if, if, the, if the end user was able to do that. Um, and, and, and I guess that maybe the, the, the reason you're bringing that up is because those medical device apps are, they're relatively infrequently used, right? I mean, if it's, um, uh, it's like, uh, let's say, an insulin monitor, I mean, sure, lots of people have diabetes, but we're talking about a much smaller addressable market than we would be for um, everyday population. Um, so relatively few users, but a, a very motivated user base um, looking to, to hack or crack the app. Correct. Okay. Any, any other points on this slide before we move to uh, the world of uh, virtualization? I think we can move on. Okay. So, yeah, so in virtualization is a topic that I know um, some of your team has been focused on for some time. And it, it ends up being something that we, um, the virtualization guards are something that you were able to measure in research that you've done since the threat report came out. I thought maybe uh, it would make sense to give an overview of you know, what is virtualization, what are the legitimate reasons it's used, and then what are the reasons that it's sometimes used by threat actors? Yeah, of course. So Android app virtualization, uh, we found that is becoming more popular and we wanted to, to get a better understanding of it, whether it can be an attack vector, and we found that it can. So, well, for those that don't know what it is, uh, so there's, especially in Android, but it, technically it can be done in, in other platforms too. So this software is usually used for convenience of having multiple social media or, or gaming profiles on the same phone, because uh, usually you can only have one instance of an app on a phone uh, at, at a given time, but virtualization software allows you to have multiple copies. For example, you could have a, a professional uh, Facebook account and also a, prof a personal Facebook account on, on the same phone and having an easy way to switch between these. So while uh, apps like this can be convenient and some of the apps like this even claim that they protect your privacy, they also enable more permissive environment compared to standard Android sandbox. So essentially it's bypassing the Android security model and introducing a lot of risk for the end user. What this means is, uh, is that a, a virtualization app can interact with the app being virtualized as if the device was rooted, even when it's not. Uh, for example, uh, data extraction, uh, hooking, code injection, analysis of the app become significantly easier in that scenario. Okay, so so we're so there are good and um, rightful reasons to use virtualization, and then and then virtualization is sometimes used as kind of a first step for a for a threat actor. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, it so be, it can be a means for for delivering malware, even in some cases. Okay, right. So so let's I guess with, with that in mind, um, let's take a look at some of the research you did around. Um, the uh, pop, the um, amount that a particular protection is used and the amount that a protection, particular protection is triggered by an attack. And I think we have this for both Android and, and iOS, so we can maybe start with uh, Android. Yes, so we wanted to compare how the data of apps in the wild, how they're being interacted with, compared to 
how our customers use our products, what kind of features are mostly used. So in this graph on the horizontal axis, you can see how common it is to, to have a protection against that attack vector in an app versus on the ver vertical axis, how often a guard like this uh, is detecting malicious activity when, when launched in, a, in the hands of an end consumer. And what we found is not unexpected. Uh, the, more, the, the types of protections that we developed more recently are getting less use because, just because there's less time to adopt them. But they are detecting new important attack vectors like the Android app virtualization that I just talked about. And it's still important to, to keep, keep in touch with the threat landscape. It's always, uh, always evolving. We need to be ahead of it or, or at least keep up with it. As a, as a digital AI AppSec, that's what we strive to do, to be one step ahead of, of the threat landscape whenever possible. And uh, yeah, it's important to, to remember that security is not a set and forget thing, it's always changing. So as a, as a company, as a business that has apps, that has software, you need to keep that in mind all the time. Okay, so if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, it's you're exhorting our um, uh, people in the audience who who are already implementing some level of protections, um, and I guess reminding them that some of the guards that they implemented um, last quarter or last year, depending on when they last checked, um, uh, may have uh, there may be more guards than the guards that they've put in place. Yeah. And, and and that's what this graph is showing. Yes. Is that, okay. Well, if you if we talk to companies ten years ago, they would say, "Give us root detection. It's it's served as a sort of a catch-all solution because mm -hmm. that environment enables all all of these other attacks." Now we know that that is definitely not enough. It's a first line of defense, but then you need to actual actually detect the malicious activities that's happening. You need to detect code modification code injection and, and all these new things that we talked about. Okay, so if, as we move to the left on this graph, it, we're seeing guards that are implemented less often by uh, our customers. And, and therefore, those are guards that probably more of the audience would have an opportunity to implement and thus catch more attacks, right? Correct. Okay. Um, so are there is any differences between the uh, guards that are implemented less often on Android um, versus I those that are implemented less often on iOS? So the types of protections we offer for each platform differs a little bit, but when we did the, the same exercise for iOS, we saw the exact same pattern. Uh, more recent protections are getting less use. In this case, that being signature verification, where it was more, more of a a recent addition to our product, and it's obviously a, li a little bit underutilized in the app protections that we see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see what else do we have here. So we uh, there's a couple of other. I think uh, well, maybe to sum up before we move on, there's a couple more poll questions we want to find a little bit more about um, the people um, listening. Any uh, any uh, any other highlights from the the threat report, um, or and we're going to ask people what they'd like to see in the next report as, as part of the poll, but maybe things that the threat team themselves want to measure next time, or other just things to underline from what we've talked about. Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how, how our findings change over time, how the threat landscape evolves, mm. because uh, we know that it's changing all the time, and we research ahead uh, we see new emerging tools but it would be also really nice to to see that in the data that we collect ourselves so as we do a report next year i'm looking forward to see how it compares to the last one yeah uh, i'm also looking forward to that and actually a, a question just came in before we move on to the next slide uh, specifically around virtualization i think it's worth asking in case uh, more people have this question so this is from um Fiducci asking uh, if we could, or I'm, I'm actually going to ask it to you, Taras, because I know you have a better explanation than I do, um, asking, could, can you please explain again how virtualization can cause a threat? 
is it having more accounts on a rooted device will expose all this information? It's not specifically having more accounts being a risk, but it's the way the virtualized environment allows that. So virtualized environment basically runs the virtualized app in its own memory. So it can interact with it in malicious ways uh, while in a normal scenario, one app is not able to interact with another app on the same phone in any way, uh, unless uh, there's some special conditions that are met. So basically, that beats Android application sandboxing, where an app is being restricted from, from, all, from the rest of your device. So for example, if you accidentally download some malware, it cannot just simply go into your banking application and, and look at your financial data unless your device is rooted, or in this case, if it's being run in a virtualized environment like this. Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, it's a, it's a kind of way of, um, if the app is running in a virtualized environment, it has the potential to have overridden some of the sandboxing features that are built into Android in this case. Correct. Okay. For well, that to be a real risk, the virtualization app needs to be compromised itself or designed to be malicious. So it's not like if you somehow could verify security of a virtualization app, you don't need to worry about it, but it's very difficult to do. Uh, there's apps getting regular updates. Uh, we've seen even cases of, uh, well, we haven't seen an actual case of this yet, but observing other types of attacks, uh, supply chain attacks in particular, it's very difficult for businesses and for man or uh, creators of apps to even know what code gets into their app just because of there's so many third-party dependencies. Right. So verifying that virtualization app is safe is uh, nigh to impossible. Mm. Okay, so yeah, that, that's an important point. So if, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's not that virtualization apps themselves are malicious, it's that there could be a change to one um, and they could be made relatively easily made malicious. And it's and I think the last thing you were saying is it's, it's very difficult to um, to determine whether or not there's been some sort of meddling with the app itself. Okay, right. cool. So hopefully that helps um, Fiducci. And um, all right, let's let's jump in uh, to a, a couple last two polls just to find out about. Uh, well, we'd love to find out uh, what people want to see more of in the next application threat report. We really enjoyed putting this one together and we're very, very happy with the amount of attention that it's gotten. And we wanna know, you know, hey, what else can we do? Um, what are the parts that were most interesting to you and you wanna see more of? Um, and if there's something that's not listed here, you know, please fill out the other section. Um, so again, we'll give people say 15 more seconds. Um, I know time works differently when we're presenting. So I'll pause here. Say five more seconds, and then we can um, go ahead and close. And let's see what we've got. Okay, so uh, let's see. <clears throat> Most people wanting to know more about attack techniques, which is great, um, and I think. Yeah, I would agree is, is tremendously important. Um, second most around more uh, data around industries. And I'm, I'm very, very happy to be doing that next time around. Um, third place, time-based threat data, which we'll be able to do for the first time because that was the, the challenge we have with number one is we, we had nothing to compare it to. Um, and then in last place, I'm actually a little bit relieved to see is attack attribution. Um, which I think speaks to the fact that we have real security practitioners in the audience because the attribution is always something that the press wants to talk about and it's always something that I'm a little bit um, hesitant to talk about. I mean, then we've got a few votes for others, so we'll we'll check on those. I can't see those right now, but we'll definitely check on those and, and, um, and hopefully add them all to the next report. So thanks for those answers. And uh, last poll was just curious, you know, which of, of these organizations our audience is already um, engaged with. So the Organization of Web App Security Professionals or OWASP. Um, if you're in financial services, are you involved with or a member of um, the financial services information sharing group? Um, uh, 
if you are in security, do you get your news from um, ISMG? Um, against Integrated Security uh, Media Group. Uh, are you following um, the developments in FIPS 140, especially the latest uh, Dash 3? And are you ISO, um, you know, are you a member of um, the ISO group and trying to conform to the quality standards that ISO has? So we'll give five more seconds there. And let's close. So we've got uh, just over 50% uh, are OWASP members, which is not, not surprising, and I'm happy to see 10% um, in ISO 27001, which is actually a little bit higher than I expected. I'm sorry, that's 26% um, in ISO. And then 8% uh, in FSI SAC and 16% uh, um, in FIPS 140. And no, no, no votes for ISMG, unfortunately. Um, but good to know. I mean, if for sure, it's the sense that we have is OWASP is the organization that we want to be most active in. Um, and so it's good to see this. All right. So let's see. Last things to, uh, to cover before we jumped into the Q&A. So, you know, hey, we, we're seeing lots of, app, lots of threats to apps. Um, what can we do about it? Well, um, <clears throat> our recommendation, you know, as people who supply application hardening, um, or in other words, obfuscation and anti-tamper is to apply those protections. They don't necessarily have to be from digital.ai. Obviously, Tadas and I are partial to our own solution, um, but there are other ways to do this. We think, I mean, the most important thing is to not put an app out into the wild that isn't protected through, you know, obfuscation and anti-tamper. Um, and then if you add in the ability to monitor, you can get insights for your own company that are similar to the ones that we're finding here. Um, and that's always helpful, right? Especially when you're going through the next version of your protections. You know, if, if you don't see how the attacks and where the attacks are taking place, it's, it's very difficult to effectively design your protections. Um, and then of course, you know, not all solutions have the ability to react. So, and we recommend that uh, you build in RASP capabilities into the app so that the app that you're building uh, can take uh, action automatically, such as, you know, just shut down if and when uh, tampering is detected. I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, that, that relieves the pressure on your security operations center um, and relieves the pressure on you um, knowing that, you know, if, when the worst types of attacks take place, the app is going to simply shut down or the functionality that the threat actor is trying to take advantage of is deprecated. Um, those are very helpful measures. Um, so that's, you know, some high level best practices. We're happy to talk more about it. You can contact us uh, on the website. Um, We've got many customers who are doing this today. That's why we have some of this uh, anonymized data. Um, one of the biggest, one of the top 10 biggest, actually four of the top 10 biggest banks in the world, one of which has more than 30 million instances in their customers' hands. We're protecting billions of transactions on a yearly basis. Um, four of the top 10 game makers are also using us, one of which um, actually used our application security to see an increase in performance. Um, that's relative to the other security vendor that they were using, um, which helped them grow to over a billion dollars in revenue. Um, we've got some of the biggest med device makers, and Thomas and I talked a little bit about some of those use cases. Um, and because we're ISO 13485 certified, we're able to, the companies that use us are able to get through FDA um, approvals much more quickly. And in one case, they saved about two years of development time because of that certification and we're able to grow that particular app to a $5.5 billion business. So, you know, lots of companies are doing this and um, we are uh, very happy about that, proud of it, and, and hoping to see even more companies protecting themselves. Um, there's some resources here. So the, the threat report itself that has a few more details that Tadas and I got into and some of the details that we, we didn't get into um, <clears throat> in the threat application threat report in the middle here. Um, you can see a third party's take, IDC in this case, is take on application hardening, um, which may or may not be useful, especially if you're going to other people in your organization to try to convince them to work with you to add security to your apps. And then um, a, a little bit deeper dive on the virtualization that Tadas covered and that um, Fiducci asked the good question about. Um, so these are free resources on our website, digital.ai. Oh, and they're also in the uh, handout section within this platform that we're on right now. 
Um, okay, so from there, I think we're, we can jump into questions. And I know I saw a couple come in. Uh, let me go to the second questions area. Okay, so um, yeah, the first one is about that, the correlation of uh, popularity with attacks. So this is from uh, Sudhindra asking, is the popularity versus active user graph also derived from data that you guys collected in the past four weeks? Correct. It's, it's not the past four weeks. It's a bit far, a bit further uh, into the past, but yes, it's from these four weeks. So the, the right the same the same four weeks that we got the other data on, but but it wasn't the past four weeks, right? It was February. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, Scott McClellan uh, asking about um, I think this is from earlier this in the presentation, asking if if the villain uses mobile game hacking as a as a kind of resume line item. You could say so. Uh, I have not seen this personally, but I mean. Everyone knows Empress is, is the biggest figure in cracking and, and there are others. So there's definitely a reputational, uh, reputational factor into cracking games. Yeah, the, the hackers that um, are that successfully crack games tend to have a name for themselves in the, in the hack, hacking forums or even on Reddit. Um, so not, yeah. you don't have to go very far to find these names. Um, and then here's another one in the chat. Oh, I think this might be, I think this is just sort of an inquiry as opposed to a question. Someone who's looking into um, launching a new app. So we can, we can talk offline on that question, uh, Tammy. So very happy to do that. Okay, if there's, I'll give a couple of, if there's, are there other questions out there? Um, So yes, well, it's a comment from one one listener saying he's surprised that the percentage of apps under attack isn't higher, and I, I think that speaks to the point you were making, Tadas, about you know if we were to expand the time frame, the numbers would go up. Um, and this is a this was a four week period, uh, and so yeah. Um, okay, and then we've got the question or we answered Fiduci, uh, a question about finding the recording, um, the recording. Oh no. Yeah, the recording will be sent out to those of you who have registered, which is everyone on this call, and it'll also be available uh, on our website in the resource center. Um, so yeah, I'll give another minute for any more questions. Um, in the meantime, very, very happy to have the level of engagement we had. Uh, appreciate all the comments and the questions and really looking forward to getting the data together for the next report. Here's maybe one last question. Uh, okay, so this may be for you, Tadas. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, ha have you done any analysis? Um, are there Android OEMs that have high security that's uh, similar to what iOS has? And he asks specifically about the Samsung Knox. We've looked at it briefly, but I, I don't think we have anything uh, interesting enough for, to share right now, but that's definitely a, a good avenue for us to explore into the future. Yeah, always interesting to, to figure out which of the OEMs have the best security, but probably not something that we would publicly endorse. Um, good. Thanks for all the feedback. It looks like people have found it interesting. Um, and thanks very much for joining. And I think we're ready to wrap. Cheers, everybody. And uh, thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.